Okay, welcome back to the second lecture uh, in our grammar theory uh, lecture series. Today we will deal with phrase structure grammars and um, that's the first lecture where we deal with actually um, actual grammar theory. Before that we only talked about uh, terminology, um, but now the real fun starts. So um, you probably, all, all of you already saw trees like this. Um, uh, as I said last, uh, in the last uh, lecture, um, the examples will be taken from German because English is a rather boring language as far as um, syntax is concerned. So there is a lot of uh, research on English done already and uh, the structures don't, the, the language has, doesn't have any, um, well, not not all of the phenomena that are uh, interesting. Uh, so we will take German as a language. Um, we have scrambling there, it's a verb second language and so on. So a lot of interesting things to look at. And um, what you see here are two examples uh, of phrase structure trees or trees licensed by phrase structure grammars. Um, you probably, if you took a syntax introduction, you probably just saw these trees and then you get some explanation um, uh, about passive and that you will get another tree because of this and that. Um, but the, the really important thing that is beneath all that are phrase structure grammars. Well, in most of the series, uh, we will look at. And uh, this is actually what we want to find, right? So that's the task of the linguist to define or find the rules and define a system that licenses uh, the the derivations or analysis of uh, sentences. So it's not the case that you learn how linguistics work if, if you draw a lot of these trees. You have to think about what, how these come about. And um, one thing that plays an important role here uh, is phrase structure grammars. And you see some uh, rules below the trees. So, um, here we have one version one could assume for a German tree uh, where we have flat, so-called flat branching. So we have an S node for sentence with a, a three N piece below it and a verb. And this is the ditransitive verb give and it is combined with all three uh, noun phrase uh, arguments in one go, right? So this is, the S that results from combining these three things. And this is the rule uh, that corresponds to this tree. And the good thing about this rule is we can apply it to other ditransitive verbs as well. So like uh, spendet, das uh, die Frau um, der Umweltschutzorganisation uh, 500 Euro spendet or something like that, right? So, um, we can do that um, with the same rule. And then there's another rule saying, okay, a noun phrase can consist of a determiner and a noun. So this rule is used for these subtrees here uh, for, for NPs. Um, now on the other side, on the right-hand side, we have a tree with a little bit more structure. So that's basically binary branching. We have only a two daughters per tree and we have a, uh, the verb with the uh, dative object here, then with the accusative and with the subject. So everything combined in one single step. Now you may ask, okay, two trees, hmm, which one is the correct one? So you can pause the slide here for some seconds and think about it, what you would uh, believe to be the right tree and not just which one you want, but also um, what are the arguments for this, right? So, so we are doing theory development here. So we have to 
provide arguments for assuming one structure and not the other. Um, so pause here, think. Okay, welcome back. So uh, the, those of you who studied at Humboldt University probably would go for, for this tree. Maybe somebody uh, else would go for another, for the flat tree or even yet another one with a VP and, and a separate subject or no tree at all. But so if you have to decide between the two, uh, two trees, I can tell you both were suggested in the literature and different frameworks. So the left-hand side is, was suggested in uh, GPSG, Generalized Phrase Structure Grammar. Um, this is what is often assumed in government and binding theory and also in HPSG. And we will talk about uh, these options and you will learn reasons for assuming uh, one rather than the other. Okay, um, just a piece of notation. Uh, what you see here is hardly readable. That's uh, the representation of, uh, of this tree in bracket notation, right? So I, I got that uh, in a paper for reviewing. Um, you can do that. Uh, well, there are two reasons for, for doing that. So first is if you want to save space uh, and you don't have space to put a nice figure in your paper, or if you are lazy, um, you don't want to draw the tree. Well, nowadays um, there, there are good packages for LaTeX, uh, for instance, um, for drawing trees. So the forest package is uh, it's really easy with this package. And so being lazy is a bad excuse and the figures are much better than uh, these, this notation. But I just wanted to include it so that you're not surprised if you see it sometime in a paper. Okay, some terminology. Um, you see a tree here, uh, an abstract one, and all the circled things here are nodes of the tree. Um, this is a, a branching node, so we have two things below it, two, two or more. Uh, this one is non-branching, so there is, um, um, well, it's actually contradicting. Uh, unary branching uh, is another word for that. So, so they are not more than uh, two of, the, uh, not more than one daughter. Um, uh, when we talk about trees, we use uh, terminology or words from uh, family trees. So the uppermost, uh, or well, the the node that is dominating to other uh, nodes is called the mother. Um, um, so A is the mother of B and C, and uh, C is the mother of D, and B and C are uh, sisters of each other. Um, we also need the relation of the dominance. Um, there's a definition down there at the slide. A dominates B if and only if A is higher in the tree and if there is a line from A to B that exclusively goes downwards. Um, that sounds difficult, but if you just look at the uh, figure and uh, the, the arrows, then you see that it's simple. So A dominates B, C, and D, and C dominates what? Okay. Um, so it's like like a hierarchy in a company or something. So the the topmost boss uh, commands uh, or dominates the uh, uh, man or woman at the level below, and they dominate the those below them. So if there's a hierarchical structure in the company. Okay, then there's immediate dominance. Um, so that's also obvious, I think. So if um, you are one level below uh, the boss, then you are immediately dominated. So if you have a big company with 100 employees, the, the uh, 
the woman at the top probably never talks to those at the bottom of the hierarchy, but nevertheless, they, uh, they are dominated, but not immediately dominated. So this is uh, the, the level that uh, somebody talks to the immediate dominance. So A immediately dominates B and C, but not D, and C immediately dominates not Okay, D, that was simple. Okay, um, another thing we talk about is precedence. A precedes B if A is located to the left of B in a tree and none of these nodes uh, dominate the other one. Immediate precedence, A precedes B and there is no element C between A and B. Also obvious. So now we look at some first example with fresh structure grammar and uh, look what we can do with it. Um, so what you see here at the top of the slide, so here NP and S and uh, NP determiner and noun rules here, this is a little grammar. So these things are the grammar rules and this is the lexicon. So the lexicon contains words and the words are assigned uh, uh, a syntactic symbol. Uh, and, and th these things are just symbols. It's playing around with symbols. So we are doing this for linguistics, but uh, biologists also use phrase structure grammars, right, for DNR, uh, description of DNR sequences and so on. So uh, this is just a formal thing. It's, it's formally defined. Chomsky did that in the 50s. Um, so if, if some of you um, has some computer science background, uh, you will know that uh, Chomsky is famous in computer science because of his work on, on these uh, grammar, phrase structure grammar types, different types of different complexity. You can do different things with it. So this is uh, something, what you see here is something of uh, intermediate uh, complexity. Um, okay. Um, what can we do with this? Um, okay, we have a bunch of words here and um, we want to use our grammar on that. There's not much we can do uh, with just these words. So we can uh, look up air uh, in the lexicon and we find that there is this rule. So we can replace air with an NP and um, then we have this string of symbols. And we can go on with this uh, and check the next symbol, that's the determiner, does uh, the next symbol, uh, Buch, um, which is a noun. So here the, the respective rule is highlighted, right? So which is applied. And now it's interesting because now we have two options. We could either go on and look up all the words or we can uh, clean up our desk first and reduce the amount of work we, we have there, the stuff lying on our desk. Um, and to, um, yeah, clean up a bit. So, and if we do that, uh, determiner and noun, um, we, we can combine this by applying this rule, right? So, and that's what we do. So this rule is applied and instead of having two symbols here, we have just one uh, symbol standing for a bigger unit. And well, the rest is almost boring. Um, uh, Dame is a determiner, kind uh, is a noun. And again, we can combine determiner and noun. We have an NP and um, the last thing or almost last thing we can do is look up the verb. So now we have NP, NP, NP and verb. And you see this uh, rule can apply here and then we have a sentence done okay that's cool right so we have uh, analyzed the the sequence of words uh, by replacing some symbols and found that that, that this is a sentence um the uh, the interesting thing about this grammar as it is written down there is that there is no 
directionality built in there. So nobody says uh, you have to start with words and try to derive uh, a sentence from it. We can also use this knowledge in the other direction. So we can say, okay, um, give me all the sentences um, that this little grammar licenses. And um, then what we would have to do is that we take this symbol and uh, apply all the rules that can be applied. So applying this rule would uh, give us NP, 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 V, and then we can go backwards and until we arrive at the lexical level so that all uh, these abstract symbols are replaced by actual words. And then we have uh, a sentence, for instance, this, right? And um, these phrase structure grammars can also pair, be paired with a semantic uh, component. And then we could say, oh, give us all sentences that mean um, er das Buch dem Kind gibt, exactly the meaning of the sentence we, we just analyzed. And then we get that sentence and nothing else. And this is, um, well, in some way or other, uh, what we are doing as humans, right? So we have, uh, that's the assumption, right? We have a set of uh, knowledge, a set of rules, a set of knowledge about language, and that is somehow a set of constraints or whatever it is, right? It's somehow applied in um, both directions. So we can analyze sentences and understand what uh, the other person said, and we can produce new sentences um, with, uh, that have a certain meaning that uh, we want to express. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I do that first. Um, this is a, what you see here is a, a, a web page where you can enter um, Polo programs and have them run for you. Uh, it works with SWI uh, Prolog, uh, uh, Amsterdam based development. And I want to show you uh, that we actually can pass with uh, phrase structure grammars. Um, if you put them into a format that is um, uh, called definite, definite clause grammars, you can enter them in most of the prolog uh, interpreters and have uh, sentences passed. So if you, you can also go there, the link is on the slides. And uh, if you do that, you have to press program and then you can enter prolog code here or such definite clause grammars. Um, Um, okay, um, so this is, uh, can I mark this? I can't. Okay, so this is uh, an example grammar. I will uh, enter it here. So just to save us some time, I copy and paste it. So that's basically the, the grammar. Uh, we had so far and some lexical items and you can now uh, pass by entering some crypting cryptic things um, yeah. So uh, this is, um, it's a little bit cryptic because uh, you, you pass a string you actually want to analyze as an argument to, to the 
sentence uh, rule, to, so to say. The, the way it works is it's called parsing as deduction and the prologue uh, engine behind that uh, does some reasoning. It's, it's a very simple parser, it's very inefficient, um, but it's built in and it's uh, handy for such demonstrations. One can establish uh, build more efficient parsers in prologue. So you pass that sentence to, to S and you, uh, it, it uses differences list, difference list. So like beginning of a list and an end. And you just say, okay, I um, want to be the rest of the list, the empty list. So that, that's the reason why this syntactic stuff is here. We don't have to worry too much about that. And I hope I didn't make a mistake now and press run. And it says false. Okay, interesting. Ja, das Buch dem Kind gibt. Ah, okay. Um, yes. Um, so, so the grammar we had in the in the course um, had the rule uh, NP 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 uh, verb because German is a verb final language and I didn't want to pretend it is verb second but for the demo I uh, shows this rule and here it has a verb in second position so that it looks more natural so I fooled myself okay um, so we put the gift at the second position and I press run again and then it should say true hooray okay yeah, so, so this is our rule. And um, what Prolog does uh, to, in order to pass a sentence is that it tries to find an NP at the beginning. We can actually show that. Um, So, so you can see all the steps it does now. So in order to, to prove that S, uh, this S is a sentence, um, it goes to the first clause, so to say, the first thing of the rule of the right-hand side. So that's NP, right? So it's green now. And um, now it tries all NP rules as we will see. Um, so it tries to find a determiner. And in order to do that, the first thing here has to be a determiner. That's not the case because it's only does or deem that could be uh, realized as a determiner. So it tries the, the NP again, it's yellow now, as you see, and Hooray, it finds the air as an NP, right? So this is now successful. The, the uh, green part is after this air. And it's, oops, what did I do now? Shit. <clears throat> um, so it found this, I, I pressed this, so that was a fast route. Um, so it found the air, right? And returned the rest of the string, gibt das Buch dem Kind. Um, we do it again. Air, NP, air, determiner fails. Now, air uh, is, the NP is tried again. Air is found, the rest here uh, gibt, right? So it returns to, to here right? It's at this point in the rule now, and it uh, has to find a verb uh, in order to go on with this rule. So let's see whether there is a verb. Uh, it exits because uh, gibt is a verb, and gibt is removed, so this is the rest of the list that has to be processed, and we have to find another NP, as you see here, 
and uh, this goes on the D does it has been found uh, Buch is found and so on I think you get the idea right so it, it walks down uh, into these uh, things okay now the interesting thing is um, can I switch that off? The interesting thing is that we can do even more interesting things with uh, this grammar. We can say, oh, just give us anything you can analyze with it. So this X, right? So before we said, okay, is this string well formed? And now we say, oh, give us everything you can do with it. And in order to see something, we say print X new line. And then we say, okay, search for an X. Uh, if you find some, give it to us, print it. And then we say, we are not happy. We, we say fail. and uh this means try for another x right so polo goes back and tries to find another x and then it if it finds some it will print it so let's see whether i made a mistake ah okay so here you see uh that the oh it does a lot so um so the, these very few rules two rules produce a lot of uh, strings. Uh, er gibt dem Buch das Kind, for example. Er gibt das Kind dem Kind. Um, so there are some good ones, but there's also er gibt das Buch er, er gibt uh, dem Kind er, or something like that. So that's ungrammatical. Um, <coughs> we should think about it. Why is it ungrammatical? And uh, work a bit harder on our grammar. So this is um, uh, this is the set of rules we have. And the question is, what is wrong with them? So what we get is, for example, uh, also we, we get, as we just saw, er das Buch dem Kind gibt, but we also get ich das Buch dem Kind gibt, um, which is wrong. There is um, some problem. You can think about it. I, I pause for a second. Or you, you press pause. So what is wrong with 29B? Well, yes, subject verb agreement is, uh, wrong so ich and gibt do not agree um yeah das buch das kind gibt so what is wrong here again um some form of uh, case requirement of the verb is not uh, met so gibt requires a dative but um the uh, potential dative object is in the accusative. And then we have a fourth example, er den Buch dem Kind gibt. So that's dif difficult if you don't speak German as a native speaker um, or learn German. Um, so there is um, determinant noun agreement uh, in uh, gender, gender agreement that is violated here. So we need something in our grammar to block these things. So this is what we just did. Um, that's for, these slides are for those who, who uh, just see the slides and not the presentation here. Um, so what would we need to fix these problems? So subject verb agreement in German involves person and number. Um, we have three persons and two numbers. So this, as you see, the, the thing you see in 30 is the paradigm uh, for uh, I sleep, you sleep, he sleeps, and so on. 
And the question is, how can we express this in rules? So yeah, think about it and stop the presentation and then may go, may, if you found some solution, you may go on. The simple solution is to just extend the set of uh, symbols and have symbols for NPs in the first singular, uh, per, first, uh, first person singular and a corresponding verb symbols. So we would have six symbols for nominal phrases, six for verbs, and six rules instead of one rule. That's sort of not great, is it? Um, because that's not all, right? We have to do this similar uh, thing on similar things on the NP level. So we have to have uh, person number uh, case information there. Um, and so we have uh, three by two by four, 24 new categories for, for NPs in total. And depending on the uh, valence patterns, we assume we have three by two by X categories for verbs. So hmm, there's something wrong and it's getting worse. So for a determiner noun agreement, um, we have uh, agreement in uh, gender, in number, and in case. So this the, the 31 shows some examples. Der Mann, die Frau, das Kind. So we have different determiners according to gender. gender. Um, das Buch, die Bücher. We have different forms um, according to number. Um, des Buches, dem Buch. Uh, different forms, different determiners, different inflection according to case. So instead of uh, our simple rule, NP goes to, to determiner and noun, we have um, six rules for nominative, six for uh, genitive, six for dative, six for accusative. So that means 24 symbols for determiners, 24 symbols for nouns, and 24 rules instead of one. There's, uh, on top of this, there's declension class in German. So it would be 48. Uh, rules. They are just two, but if, if you do it cleverly, but um, uh, you have to have them in all the rules and um, that's obviously not correct. So generalizations are not captured. So we cannot say where, where can an NP be placed because we cannot talk about NPs. I mean, we as humans see that there's NP in this complex symbol, but um, from a formal point of view, it's just NP with something. So the, the two NPs don't have anything in common if the, they differ in, in case and number or something. Um, the commonalities between the rules are not obvious. And the solution uh, for this problem is that we um, assume features uh, with values and then identify the values. So instead of um, the just the category NP, we have the category NP with uh, features for person number and case. And our rules would be, look like uh, the following two. So an NP with third person singular nominative consists of a determiner, feminine singular nominative, noun feminine singular nominative. Or uh, the second rule, um, uh, it consists of a determiner, masculine, singular, nominative, or a noun, masculine, singular, nominative. So we have two sim sim um, similar rules. The difference is just whether the gender is feminine or masculine. Now, we can generalize over these rules and derive a rule schemata. So here you see one uh, NP uh, third uh, number um, case and determiner gender number case and noun gender number case. Okay. Um, the the interesting thing is that um, the the values of number and case do not matter. So the only thing that matters in this rule is that they are identified. 
So if you have certain genders in the lexicon, um, like feminine, masculine, or neutral, then they can be inserted there. And then the noun, let's say for the determiner, and then the noun has to have the same uh, gender and number features. Okay, the, the number three of the NP here is just fixed. Um, it, uh, because you have a determiner and a noun, it's clear that this is an NP in, uh, in the third person. And so you just write that down. And for personal pronouns like I or uh, you, you have different uh, uh, person features. Ah. Now, um, for for the sentence rule, we can just uh, establish the subject verb agreement here by using the same uh, feature, same variable, so to say, for the feature. So person one of the nominative element has to be, have the same value as the person one uh, feature of the verb. So uh, subject verb agreement is taken care of. One can, instead of having per two and num two here, one can write an underscore. That means I don't care what the value is here. So for uh, objects, we don't have object agreement in German. So the person and number are irrelevant for on the clause of domain. Yeah, and case values are fixed. So that's just written down um, that a ditransitive verb needs these three cases. Okay, so that's it um, for now. Um, you can uh, do that as a homework. Um, write a grammar that can account for these uh, sentences. Here, der Mann hilft dem Kind. Uh, er gibt ihr das Buch, er wartet auf ein Wunder. And the grammar has to reject uh, the uh, examples in 33. Der Mann hilft ihr, er gibt ihr den Buch. So there, the, the, you have to have the features in the grammar that exclude these sentences. And what is very important, it has to be one grammar for all these uh, sentences. And you can do that on paper. Uh, but also with the computer, which I would highly suggest because you learn from doing it yourself. Um, the, if you do it on paper, the task is not to write three grammars for these three sentences. People very often do that. That's not what linguists do. Linguists work on grammars for languages, not on grammars for individual sentences. And that's... Um, also something you, you probably will do in your exam, uh, the final uh, degree work you, you do for this course. And people did that in exam, although I mention that very often. So it's one grammar we are after. 